Hello everyone and welcome to lecture today. <clears throat> um, today we'll be extending uh, some ideas that we've developed for aligned integrals to the next type of integral that we can do on scale and vector fields. And um, the idea is that um, if you know aligned integrals are all about essentially integrating a scalar or a vector field over a curve, um, the next um, more complicated type of surface that we can consider our type of shape that we can consider integrating over is that of a surface and this is going to allow us to do a number of different things um, the, the line integral allowed us to define the circulation of a vector field the surface integral is going to allow us to define the, the, the flux of a vector field uh, through a surface, a given surface or the amount that a given field, vector field is flowing through uh, a specific surface. It'll also give us a uh, means towards going forward and actually um, redefining the divergence uh, in a very similar manner to how we redefined the, the curl using the circulation, but for the divergence we'll use the concept of flux. Um, this is also going to lead to us being able to develop very, very strong integral theorems um, that generalize the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we've already in some sense seen a little bit of um, when it comes to integrating uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the line integral of a conservative vector field. So we'll start off by saying we'll let R of U comma V be the parametric vector equation of some surface S in which case um, S is a mapping from UV space into, uh, so we'll say uh, S is a mapping from some domain in UV space to 3D, because in general, a uh, surface is something that's defined in 3D. Um, so we really can think of R of UV as being this, a mapping from some space in you know, a two-dimensional parameter space to three-dimensional space. And the idea is that um, this is always going to define some sort of surface. So um, let's take a look here and try and get uh, some sort of picture of what's going on This is going to be a diagram. So whenever we consider a surface that's parameterized by two separate parameters, U and V, uh, these parameters are going to be coming from some domain D in UV space. And then over in, uh, you know, this is uh, the domain of this surface mapping. And then the range of this surface mapping is going to be 
some surface in three-dimensional space. where points on the surface correspond to uh, specific points in UV space. So for instance, um, if you think of this, you could think of, say, fixing some points in UV space. And the question is, why is this giving us a surface? Let's just think of you know fixing several points in UV space. We'll fix U1, U2, and U3. In which case, if we fix U1, and this actually gives us a parametric curve, which is the parametric curve R of U1 comma V, We fix u2, we get the curve r of u2 comma v. And if we fix the value u3, we get r of u3 comma v. So for instance, uh, just say for argument's sakes that u1, u2, and u3 correspond to these values right here. When we fix them, we get a, a whole bunch of parameter values of V, which essentially, essentially corresponds to, on the surface, three parametric curves. If you one parametric curve that looks like this, and one that looks like this, and then one that looks like this. And similarly, we can consider fixing three separate values of V. Sure enough, what we'll get is we'll get three separate parametric curves, R of U comma V1, R of U comma V2, and R of U comma V3. So fixing these values correspond a whole number of points in the u-direction corresponding to these fixed values. And sure enough, on the surface itself, we'll get a curve here corresponding to v3, and a curve on the surface corresponding to v1, and lastly some curve on the surface corresponding to v or v, V1 right here, and the middle one is, say, V3. All right, so the, the idea here is that um, this is exactly, uh, you know, the idea that you want to have in your head of uh, what a parametric surface is representing. Um, it's essentially a way of describing a surface using parameterization, just like uh, we describe a curve using parameterization with one parameter. Because a curve is, in some sense, a one-dimensional object. Um, uh, a surface is, in some sense, a two-dimensional object, so there should be two free parameters. Um, I'll give you uh, two separate examples but there are you know, infinitely many examples you can come up with. Um, the first one will be the sphere. And if you remember spherical coordinates from uh, calculus, multivariable calculus class, um, the parameterization of the sphere in terms of two parameters should be relatively clear. Um,
if you don't remember, it's okay. But I, de I definitely recommend going through and reviewing these. Um, the main idea here being that if we have some sphere And points on the sphere can be described by um, a number in a number of different ways, but the, the main way here is by using the the angles from the x-axis and the the, 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 the z-axis. Specifically, if uh, in the the x-y plane any point on the sphere can be represented by some position vector and specifically we actually have two separate uh, coordinates that define points on the sphere um, there's a number of different ways of doing this but if we say call this angle the angle V and we call the angle out to the point along the x-axis, the angle U. Um, let me just move this y right here to make this a little bit nicer. So that this is the the y-axis right here. Any given point in the sphere can be described by U and V. And uh, typically in uh, you know, a multivariable calculus course, you start out by looking at this as theta and phi. So if you go back to your calculus book and you look at spherical coordinates, uh, U and V here are there's the theta and phi um, defined for spherical coordinates. So uh, I can definitely explain where this is coming from. Uh, if you want to see where spherical coordinates is coming from and kind of review the derivation but um, when uh, you know you go through and you do the trigonometry out for how the x, y, and z coordinate depends on these angles, essentially the formula that you come up with is that x is equal to r cosine of u sine of v, y is r sine of u sine of v and z is r cosine of v. And this is in the range for u and v, you know, u between 0 and 2 pi, and v between 0 and pi. If we uh, open up a plot of this, this is exactly what we see. Here you see a plot of this sphere right here. And uh, this is actually the, the sphere itself. So over the entire range of uh, u and v from, or u from zero to two, two pi and v from zero to pi. And that's written right here. And the, the parameters in x, y, and z are written right here. You see when u equals zero, v equals zero. Um, you get the curve right here. This is this is the the, the curve for the fixed value of u equals zero. That's a semicircle. Right, so v here on this blue curve goes from zero to two pi, while u is fixed at zero. That's why this color is blue right here. And if you rotate this around for u from zero to two pi, you get every single different part of the sphere along this curve. And then we also have to describe points with the parameter v. So if we go through and change v now, but fix values, or so fix values of v, but let u be open, you see that what you get is all of the curves going up and down. So then these are circles going up and down the boundary of, sphere, uh, of the sphere. So this, for instance, is v equals 1.2 you get this fixed curve right here. So really, um, any parametric surface, you can just think of as a collection of uh, many, many curves. 
infinitely many curves. And this is very clearly showing that for this 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 shape, the sphere. So these are all the fixed values of V on the sphere. And these are all the fixed values of U on the sphere. And thus any point on the sphere can be uh, directly described as you know a fixed value of two of these these points or two of these parameters. So for instance, if we look at the parameter when u equals 1.9 and v equals, let's say, 0.9, this is the exact point in the sphere that uh, is being described uh, by this, this uh, expression. So let's just consider one more example. We can consider the uh, torus. And this came up uh, earlier in one of our, our previous examples when we were talking about curves, uh, where I mentioned the, the equations of the torus just briefly. We can think of the torus as a circle that we rotate around the z-axis, or a given axis. To obtain a donut-like shape, which, um, you know, we can go through and directly um, derive the equation of the torus very, very nicely. And I'm not gonna do that here um, but it makes a lot of sense uh, based on the fact that the torus is you know, almost like as a combination of two circles or uh, a, a circle of revolution. So the torus can be directly described by uh, the mapping R plus R cosine of U multiplied by sine of V R plus R cosine of U times sine of v. Oops, that this first one shouldn't be sine, but it'd be cosine of v right here. And the last one is going to be r sine of u. So it's relatively straightforward to take these equations and kind of manipulate them to show them, show that exactly what we're getting here is uh, two, these two separate circles. Uh, here, R is the radius of the larger torus, or radius of the larger circle. And smaller, lowercase r, is the radius of the smaller circle. Um, it's also important to point out that a range of parameters in our parameter space, u here is from 0 to 2 pi, and v here is from 0 to 2 pi. No, not including 2 pi. Same thing up here. This uh, I put it less than or equals to, but this should be just less than. Otherwise, we get a, a double mapping. So if we open up our plot, this right here is a plot of the torus. Uh, these these equations that I just wrote down right here, r plus r cosine u sine v. Yeah, this is cosine v, perfect, sine of v, perfect, and then r sine of u. Uh, and we're seeing exactly 
uh, this is from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 2 pi, and same thing as for the, the sphere equation for different fixed values of our parameter, uh, we're getting exactly you know, fixed curves. Uh, the union of all the curves represents this surface. So if you change fixed values of V, you get fixed smaller circles. Um, and if you change values of U, you get uh, fixed larger circles going around the torus. So these are two, two very nice examples um, that we'll see will prove useful. So uh, we'll, we'll start uh, by first just deriving the formula for um, the surface area of a given surface and then show that this actually uh, is something a little bit more general. Uh, it can be thought of as something a little bit more general, which is called a surface integral. Um, and this process is very much like it was uh, for the, um, the formula for deriving the, the, the arc length formula, or that, that integral for arc length. Uh, the main idea is that hey, we're going to end up getting some sort of double integral. But um, so we partition our domain u into very small pieces. In this case, in this picture, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces along u. We have one, two, three, four, five pieces along along V for fixed values of V. So on our surface, uh, this partition is going to correspond to a similar sort of picture where we uh, we have this partitioning. of the surface into a whole bunch of very small pieces. The main idea for finding an expression for the surface area is trying to get an, an integral expression here. So. Um, if we say approximate the surface area on each one of these pieces, right, the exact surface area will be approximated by say something that we'll call delta capital S. This piece say will correspond to a corresponding piece delta D in our partition or delta D is equal to uh, delta u times delta v for the partition. And technically, we should, we should number this ij because we have uh, a certain number of partitions along the x-axis, or along the, um, the u-axis and the v-axis here. So we'll call this delta dij, delta dij, where this is delta ui and delta vj. And the main idea here, if we consider this small patch, is to think of the following. So the actual surface, we'll kind of zoom in on this small patch right here. The actual surface itself maybe is curling up, or is uh, curving up, I should say. This is on that very small patch, delta Sij, curving up like this. And uh, we're not going to get the exact value of the surface area here because of this curving. But if we go small enough with our partition, uh, we will be able to approximate this specifically by using, if I have a tangent vector in this direction right here, the tangent vector in this direction right here at this point. Then the parallelogram in 3D that's spanned by these two vectors 
is an approximation to this uh, this delta s i j. Um, right, if you kind of think of if this vector right here is the approximate length in this direction and this tangent vector right here is the approximate length of the surface in this direction then the, um, the, the, the value of the area of the parallelogram spanned by these two vectors is approximating the surface here. This picture that I've drawn right here is very exaggerated, but think of these as being infinitesimally small, so very, very, very small, so small that um, this difference right here is almost non-existent. And this is going to be the key, because uh, we mentioned before is that if I fix values of u and fix values of v, I get a curve. Um, and specifically, right, uh, these curves right here correspond to fixed values of u. So u1, u2, u3. And these curves right here correspond to fixed values of v. So you can say v1, v2, v3. Um, it doesn't take much, much thought to realize that, well, if I have a fixed value of v1, right, like this curve right here is a fixed value of v1, taking the partial derivative of the position vector for that fixed value of v1 is or taking dr partial r partial u at any point is going to give me a vector that's tangent to the curve at that point. And uh, we know that the uh, the actual approximation to the length at this point is dr du times delta u. And same thing uh, at this point right here in this direction. This vector right here is dr dv. Let me make this a little bit bigger so that I can put that in there. Uh, this is just a zoomed in picture of one of these subsections or one of these sub pieces. This is dr dv times delta v. And we know that, um, so now we can do this for each one of these sections, delta sij. And what that means then is that delta sij, or delta sij, is the approximation to the actual surface area of each one of these sections. Delta SIJ is going to be equal to the magnitude of the cross product of this vector right here and this vector right here. Specifically, um, this is at uh, delta ui and delta vj. Same thing here. This is at uh, ij, the corner point ij, and this is at the corner point ij. Um, but so the idea here is that for each one of these pieces of the surface, uh, we have this nice approximation. And this is coming directly from the fact that the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors in three-dimensional space will always be the area of the parallelogram spanned by A and B. This is uh, one of your nice properties from chapter six uh, that we ended up uh, showing and seeing in chapter six, all, all the way back in chapter six. So the idea then is that we can take this and take delta s i j and uh, re-express that a little bit nicer. Let's we'll say it's the magnitude of dr du across dr dv. Um, delta ui, delta vj are both positive, and they'll both come out. They're uh, you know just scalar values, so they'll come out.
and uh, I'll omit the dependence on i and j here just to make this short, but remember each one of these is different at each different value of i, j. So really we should have uh, you know an index here. I guess I can put one big, and this is being evaluated at the um, the partition piece i, j. And uh, the total expression for the total surface area of our surface S then is approximated by the double summation I from 1 to M, J from 1 to N of each one of these delta SIJs. Because what we're saying is that if th this is our, our total surface S, and we cut the surface up into all of these smaller partitions, um, and each piece of the partition, the surface area is approximated by uh, this value right here, delta SIJ, the total surface area is going to be approximately equal to this double summation. Which, as we know, is equal to now the double summation of the magnitude of dr du cross dr dv times delta ui delta vj. And this expression is really, really nice because this is exactly right, um, the type of Riemann sum, only this is a Riemann sum from, uh, say, a calculus two or a calculus four class, a multivariable calculus class. But it's specifically saying, and we, we can prove. I'm not, not going to get into the proof here because it's more of a more of an advanced topic. But um, we can prove that uh, the exact value of the surface area is going to be, so we'll call this sum, just for simplification, Sn. Call this sum Sn. It's going to be the limit as. Um, and we could, I guess, to make this as simple as possible, we'll keep the partition sizes the same. Uh, they don't have to be, but it's the, the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum. So as the, the partitions get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and uh, sure enough, this uh, is exactly equal to then the double integral over the space D, so over our the space in our parameter space of the magnitude, and uh, like I said, I'll make this IJ just to indicate that this is being evaluated at each sub piece. But this is exactly equal to the double integral of dr du. cross dr dv du dv and uh, what, what, what we'll do is we'll um, actually call this, this is something special, this is uh, the, what's called the surface integral, a surface area of some surface S is the surface integral of the constant function one over that surface. That's what this is called. We evaluate the surface integral by using the parameterization and transferring this to a double integral over D, where DS, that is called, sometimes called the surface area element, 
is the magnitude of the cross product of dr du, which is the tangent vector to the surface the u direction, with dr dv, the tangent ve vector to the surface in the v direction. So this is why this magnitude is popping up, um, because the, 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 the surface is changing as u and v change, in uh, the surface area of that needs the change in that needs to be uh, taken into account. But uh, we'll end up seeing that this idea of surface integral uh, actually extends to any scalar function or vector function that we want to do the surface integral of over a general surface, uh, which is super important for defining things like the flux of a vector field through a given surface. But for now, we'll just stick with this surface area formula and see if we can do a couple of examples. Um, probably just do do one example um, that would be familiar to everyone, uh, and this is the idea of the surface area of a sphere. And well, we'll start with the parametric equations of the sphere, which we talked about before. It's these parametric equations right here. And the first thing that we need is those those tangent vectors on the sphere, dr du, dr dv. So to get those, in, um, uh, sometimes a, a nice simplification is that uh, partial derivatives, dr du, can actually be, be just written with what's called subscript notation. You have to be careful with this because there's multiple different subscript notations in mathematics. But this does sometimes help uh, simplify what we're writing uh, when we're doing tangent vectors to surfaces. Um, but dr du is the u partial derivative of this, which is going to be negative r sine of u times sine of v. That's the partial derivative of the x component. The partial derivative of the y component if u is going to be r cosine of u sine of v, and the partial derivative of the z component is going to be zero. It doesn't depend on, on u at all. And then the other tangent vector is dr dv or rv. And rv is going to be the v partial derivative of this expression. Which is going to be r cosine u cosine v. going to be r sine of u sine of v, or cosine of v, and it'll be negative r sine of v. And um, I mentioned before these are tangent vectors. I'll, I'll, I'll show that right now, just to kind of give you some some visual visual proof of what's what's going on here. Um, it's always nice to see uh, see pictures uh, illustrating uh, exactly you know, what you're doing for your mathematics. So in this case, 
Right, this is our sphere with our, our coordinate curves for fixed values of our uh, ordinates. And if we pop on these tangent vectors right here, we see exactly what we're talking about. So this RV here, right, is uh, for fixed values of V giving us where V is that angle from the Z axis. So the derivative of the position vector with respect to V is giving us um, a vector that's pointing tangent to the curve in the direction of increasing V. All right, so we call that zero as we increase V, that tangent vector is pointing like that, or tangent to the surface. And likewise U, if we look at U, we'll do it for a, a larger fixed value of V, maybe 1.15 right here, a little bit lower, 1.05. partial derivative ru of the position vector with respect to u is giving us a position vector that's tangent to the surface in the direction of increasing u. And what's interesting here, and I haven't plotted it out, but it's not too too bad to plot out, um, uh, so I can, I'll leave it to you to try and figure out how to plot it out, is to plot out the, uh, the cross product of these two vectors is going to be what's called the normal vector to the surface. Right? At any point on the surface, the cross product of R u and R v is going to be a vector that's exactly normal to the surface. Um, and for the sphere, this is uh, we actually can tell exactly what this is going to be um, because it's a sphere. So we always know what the normal is going to be. But uh, it is important to, to practice going through the calculations. Um, all right, so I, I recommend you go through and actually simplify the calculations down for the sphere. Because if you were to say do it for the ellipse or for um, you know any any other uh, more complicated shape, uh, this wouldn't be the, the the case. So let's just go through and practice finding this R U cross R V. This is just going to be the cross product of this vector and this vector. Uh, this is the vector that's going to give us our normal vector. It's always normal to the surface. So it'll be this times, well, we cross out this uh, first. It'll be this times this. So it'll be r squared times negative 1 times cosine of u. sine squared of v, and then it'll be minus 0 times uh, this right here. The next one will be negative times, it's uh, going to be this times this, which is negative times negative, so it's positive r squared sine of u times sine squared of v. And it'll be minus zero again because it's zero uh, times this term right here. And then lastly, it'll be r squared times negative one sine squared of u is sine times sine sine of v times cosine of v, so it's sine of v, cosine of v, and then it'll be minus r squared cosine squared of u, sine of v times cosine of v. This is exactly that normal vector as a function of uh, u and v. It's going to be negative r squared cosine of u 
sine squared of v. And we can actually bring the negative r squared of u, uh, negative r squared out because it's common to each term here. That's negative r squared times cosine of u sine squared of v. Uh, it'll be sine of u times sine squared of v. And then lastly, you have sine squared plus cosine squared here, so it'll just be sine of v cosine of v. And so this is it. This, this is the normal vector, and uh, it's actually going to be the, what's called the inward normal vector because it points into the sphere. Um, the outward normal vector uh, is just negative times this inward normal vector. But uh, the idea here is that we don't really care about the direction for now. We will care about it later. But this is going to be R U, the magnitude that we're looking for in the uh, integral. The magnitude of this is going to be uh, this squared, square root. So it'll just be R squared times the square root of cosine squared u sine to the fourth of v plus sine squared of u sine to the fourth of v plus lastly And uh, we'll just put this in below. And just make all of this to the power of one half. Sine squared of v, cosine squared of v, all to the power of one half. Which greatly simplifies. You can factor out uh, a sine squared of v from each one of these terms to get that this is square root of sine or r squared times the square root of sine squared which is r squared times the absolute value of sine of v and then what you're left with when you factor out well this is cosine squared plus sine squared of u which is one um, and what you're, what you're left with is just sine squared plus cosine squared which is the square root of one This is equal to r squared actually just times sine of v because v, remember, is between 0 and pi, which means that sine of v is between a lower bound of 0 and an upper bound of 1 in, in this interval right here. This is why the absolute value of sine v here is the same thing as sine of v. Uh, which will be nice when we go through and integrate. And luckily, all right, uh, this finding this normal field sometimes is the longest step of the process because this integral is not not super super difficult to evaluate. Uh, we have the surface area. is equal to the surface integral of 1 ds over the surface s and this is going to be exactly equal to the integral over d which is from 0 to pi 0 to 2 pi of ds, which is the magnitude of the cross product of rv with ru, du dv. So this double integral gives us the, the formula for the surface area of s. This is going to be the integral from 0 to, to pi 
integral from 0 to 2 pi of just r squared times sine of v and this first integral of the function doesn't depend on u uh, at all so this first integral is just equal to 2 pi and uh, the, we have that this is the same thing then as 2 pi r squared times the integral from 0 to pi of sine of v dv which is 2 pi times r squared times cosine of v is the uh, negative cosine of v the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine this is from pi to zero so the surface area is equal to 2 pi times r squared times cosine of 0 minus cosine of pi cosine of 0 is 1 and cosine of pi is negative 1 um, so our surface area formula is 2 pi r squared times 2 or 4 pi times r squared and if you go through and uh, evaluate and so do a quick Google search for the surface area formula for the sphere, uh, this is exactly what will pop up. It's uh, 4 pi times its, its radius squared. So this is a, a very, very powerful tool. We've seen that um, it's definitely giving us the, the correct result, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, I would recommend going through and doing a couple different examples just to kind of uh, become okay with the idea of calculating uh, using this formula. But the, the, the main idea here is that uh, we're directly going to be able to extend um, the idea now of uh, line integration to surface integration, to surfaces. So. Uh, just like uh, for the, the, the idea of the line integral, I'll take a copy of this picture up here just so we can kind of recall what it is we're doing here. So suppose that our surface S is immersed, right? Say is uh, surrounded. So immersed is probably a better word in a scalar field or better yet that uh, the scalar field is defined this scalar field we call phi of r on the surface. So this could be like a temperature field, or it could be a um, uh, the mass density field, right? If it's the so, for example, like phi of r could be the the mass density or the charge density. And if it's a mass density, it's measured in kilograms per meter squared because it's a surface mass density. Or it could be a charge density. 
in which case it'd be measured in coulombs, which is the unit of charge, per meter squared. All right, these are just a couple different examples of what phi could be. Um, but assume that we have uh, the scalar field uh, defined on the surface, and we want to figure out the total accumulation of this scalar field on uh, the surface in question. Well, not much change changes in our, our uh, Riemann sum uh, approximation, except for the fact that now at multiple different points on the surface, and multiple different points in each one of our subpartitions, right, we have to evaluate the value of the scalar field on each one of the points on this partition. So we have to evaluate the, the scalar field, we'll call it phi on R of ui star vj star, where ui star vj star is some sample point uh, inside each one of these subintervals. So we choose one sample point. It could be uh, you know, the left corner point, the right corner point, the midpoint. But the idea is that um, uh, we're assuming that uh, these partitions are small enough that this function phi, or phi at r of ui j star, is approximately equal to the value of phi, the value of the scalar function phi. inside the rectangle or he, he, he uh, on, well, I will say inside or on the rectangle which is uh, on this patch of surface right here so on the surface patch And then uh, the idea then is that the approximate, approximate accumulation of this function phi on the surface patch is then going to be um, on the entire surface as a whole is going to be the summation, the double summation like before, from 1 to n, 1 to n of this value of the scalar function on the surface patch multiplied by delta s i j and um, this is because if delta s i j is an approximation to the area and um, this is the approximation approximate constant value on uh, each individual patch of phi, and phi is say, if phi is a max density function, then this mass density function multiplied by this area gives us a total approximation to the amount of mass uh, on that piece of surface. And so the exact value is the limit as n goes to infinity of this approximate double sum, which is exactly the double integral over the region D of the scalar function of R U V. And remember delta S I J is the approximated by the magnitude of R U cross R V. U D V. And this is what we call the surface integral of the scalar function phi. So 
to the surface integral of a function phi is exactly equal to this double integral right here. And this really kind of uh, shed some light on what we mean by the surface integral of a function. And you can clearly see that the surface area is the surface integral of the scalar function 1, the constant function 1. So let's, let's see an example of this. Uh, suppose we have a spherical shell. And we want to find the charge on the shell. If the minimum value of the charge density is 1 this is kilogram per meter squared or kilogram per square meter and it is proportional to the square of the, the height, the z coordinate. And this gives us um, a relatively straightforward z, z uh, dependence on the, the density function, so the, the charge density function as a function of r position is just going to be equal to 1 plus z squared and we can even uh, see a direct picture of this if we go through and make a plot of this Specifically, if we go through and plot what this is going to look like, it exactly looks like this, where the, the minimum charge density here is 1, uh, that's the, uh, this dark red, and as we go up, the charge density gets larger and larger and larger until it hits its maximum value right here uh, at the, the highest point on the sphere. And same thing with the lowest point in the sphere, because uh, it depends on z squared. So that in this problem, we're looking for the, the total charge on this sphere. The total charge is going to be the surface integral over the surface S of this density function phi or the surface integral of the function 1 plus z squared. Which is going to be that double integral from 0 to pi 0 to 2 pi of 1 plus in uh, z squared here. Um, so we'll call it the sphere of radius r. I don't think I, I mentioned the radius. The 
This is a spherical shell. Of radius r. So be one plus z coordinate squared, which is r squared, cosine squared of v and ds. Remember, is r squared sine of v. du dv which breaks up into two separate double integrals This will be uh, r squared times r squared is r to the fourth times cosine squared of v times sine of v du dv. And this, this first uh, surface integral we've already, or this first double integral we've already evaluated, this is just 2 pi times r squared, or uh, not 2 pi, four, 4 pi times r squared, or the, the surface area of the sphere. And we have to add to this, uh, whatever this, this surface integral right here becomes, or this, this double integral right here. Sure enough, when, when we go through and do this, uh, this is a relatively straightforward integral to evaluate. It just becomes uh, r to the fourth. And the function here only depends on v, so the, the, u, the first integral with respect to u is just going to be 2 pi times the integral from 0 to pi of cosine squared of v sine of v dv and we can do a substitution here we'll call it uh, w substitution of w is equal to cosine of v which means that dw is equal to negative sine of v dv and the total charge on the sphere is 4 pi r squared plus 2 pi r to the fourth and it's the integral well, when cosine well v is u cosine is uh, cosine of 0 which is 1 when uh, v is pi cosine of pi is negative 1 and then we have uh, w squared and sine of v dv is negative dw so the total charge on the sphere is 4 pi r squared plus 2 pi r to the fourth times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of w squared dw 4 pi r squared plus 2 pi r to the fourth times w cubed over 3 and we have to evaluate this at 1 and negative 1 and when we do that we get 1 over 3 minus negative 1 over 3 uh, which is going to be uh, positive 2 thirds total charge Q is going to be 4 pi r squared plus 4 pi r to the fourth over 
over 3 or 4 pi r squared multiplied by 1 plus r squared over 3. And this is uh, Coulomb's. So this is the, the, the total charge, electric charge on the sphere. And uh, this is this is really really nice. It's showing that we can directly go through uh, and use this idea of uh, the, the the surface integral. So suppose that we have um, a special type of surface. We can uh, simplify the equation for the the line integral over that surface a little bit. Uh, and I shouldn't even say just a little bit. It actually simplifies it consider considerably. So uh, in um, a multivariable calculus course, uh, you have a, you typically deal with the graph of functions. So if you have a say a function of two variables, and we'll title this uh, simplification of surface integral for functions of two variables. And specifically, we'll say simplification of this surface integral for surfaces S that are functions of two variables. Um, you know, the, the sphere and any surface that uh, sort of maps maps over on itself. Uh, can't be expressible as a sing one single function of two variables, um, but um, this is why, why the, one of the main reasons that we kind of go to parameterization for more general surfaces. Uh, however, uh, many, many surfaces can be expressible as a graph of a function of two variables, um, specifically right, the graph of a function of two variables is any surface such that z is equal to a function of x and y. And um, for such such a surface, we actually have a, a simplified form for the, the, the surface the surface integral. The, the formula simplifies um, by by a lot, very very nicely. Um, Specifically, uh, if we think about parameterizing the surface, right? So if um, this this function is defined on some for x y in some domain d in two D space, d is a subset of two dimensional space. So uh, the parameterization that we can take for our surface in this case is going to be R of UV, where we'll just identify X as U and Y as V. And so our parameterization for a surface that's expressible as you know, the graph of some 2D function is going to be the following vector function. Well, x is u, y is v, and z is whatever the value of that function is. So f of u v.
and this is the correct way of parameterizing the graph of any function. Right, this is, by the way, possible uh, uh, for parametric curves as well. If you have a curve that's expressible as a function of uh, your, 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 your variables, a simple parametric curve, which we, we saw in uh, the, the gravitation example when we covered the gravitation example in the, the previous lecture. Now, um, first things first, we need to calculate the normal vector for the, the surface integral here. So we're going to need the partial derivative of, e, of r with respect to u, which is going to be 1, 0 in the partial derivative of f with respect to u. And then the partial derivative r with respect to v Partial derivative of u with respect to v is 0. The partial derivative of v with respect to v is 1. And the partial derivative of f with respect to v is going to be whatever the partial derivative of f is with respect to v. Okay. Uh, remember, this is because for our surface, z is equal to the graph of f of xy, which in this case is f of uv if we identify x with u and y with v. So that means the normal vector to our surface is going to be the cross product of ru with rv. Or uh, I shouldn't say the normal vector because it's not a unit vector in general. So we'll just go through and calculate this cross product which will be perpendicular to the surface not necessarily unit length. And uh, because it's the cross product of this vector right here and this vector right here, uh, the magnitude of this cross product, or the, the actual uh, value of the cross product vector is going to be um, 0 times this minus df du times 1. So it's going to be negative df du. The y component is going to be negative this times this minus this times this. So it's going to be negative df dv for partial f partial v. And then the z component is going to be 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0, which is just 0, or uh, which is 1. 1 minus 0, which is 1. So there you have it. This is our um, ru cross rv. And um, we know that in the, the, the formula for our, our surface integral of a scalar function, uh, we don't necessarily need this uh, normal vector, but what we do need, or we don't, we don't need the normal vector in this direction. We, we will when we get to the integral of a vector field. But for now, all we need is the magnitude of this vector. So the magnitude of ru cross rv is going to be equal to the square root of 1 squared plus df du squared plus df dv squared. And what that means is that the, the surface integral over a surface S of the function phi is going to be equal to the double integral over the region D of the scalar function phi at our surface, phi of our U, our v, or R of uv times the magnitude of ru cross rv du dv, which is exactly equal to the double integral over d of the scalar function of ruv times the square root Uh, 1 
plus df partial f partial u squared plus partial f partial v squared du dv. All right, which is uh, a little bit simpler to use and to, to go through and calculate. This also means that um, if you want that to calculate that normal vector for such a surface, you can go through and do that, and that the unit normal vector to the surface for such a surface is going to be this vector divided by the magnitude of this vector. So the, the unit normal vector for this, this surface, such a surface of you know, a graph of a function of two variables, is going to be this vector divided by its magnitude, or the, the vector 1 over the square root, this square root, 1 plus the derivative of f with respect to u squared, plus the derivative of f with respect to v squared, so it's 1 over this times this vector right here. This will be the, the unit, unit, unit normal field for every point on this, this graph, which will be important a little bit later on. Um, but the, the, the point here is that this is a, a very, very useful formula uh, for you know problems that can be written and surfaces that can be written like this. And it, it does greatly simplify uh, the process of going through and uh, calculating. So for instance, let's consider the, the following example. We'll consider finding the surface integral of the function phi of r equal to 2y squared plus z over 4x squared plus 4y squared plus one to the one half, the accumulation of this function over the portion of the surface of the paraboloid x squared plus y squared plus z is equal to 4, for which z is greater than or equal to 0. Now, the, the best way of uh, starting any problem like this is to try to get a, some, some idea of what uh, the surface you're dealing with looks like. Right, and we can do this uh, directly using the idea of you know, cross sections. This is always how you can kind of visualize what a surface is going to look like if you figure out what it looks like in terms of some of its cross sections. So given that we're looking at the surface z is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared, which when uh, x is equal to 0, gives us the curve z is equal to 4 minus y squared, which is a parabola that's opening downwards and goes up 1, 2, 3, 4, so it goes up 4 in the z axis at y equals 0, it's equal to 0, and then at y equals 2, z is equal to zero, so it looks sort of like this. 
should just try to get a nice curve right here. Perfect, right there. So kind of like this. And likewise, when y equals 0, we get the equation z is equal to 4 minus x squared, which again, we go over 2 in the x direction. When x is equal to 0, it's up here at z equals 4, and it stretches down to this point right here at x is equal to 2. And lastly, if you consider this function at z equals 0, you get the equation 0 is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared, or x squared plus y squared is equal to 4, which is a circle of radius 2 along the y-axis. All right, so this is our surface right here, our surface S. And you can clearly see why it's a paraboloid. It's a paraboloid that's opening downwards uh, as you get larger and larger and larger in X and Y. Um, and not only that, but uh, this paraboloid is immersed in this scalar function right here. So it's immersed in a scalar field that's governed by this scalar function. Uh, you can think of this scalar function as being like some sort of density function, right? Uh, like, so a, a charge density or a mass density Right, but the idea here is that um, this is uh, exactly what we're thinking of this function as on this surface S. Um, so we don't always have to make a nice visualization of this, but it, it is nice to get a small sort of like diagram representing the surface. Um, and if, if possible, it's also nice to get a visualization of this. So um, if we go through and open up uh, our Python window, the Python code, I went through and I coded up uh, that code that plots a scalar function on a given surface. And if we run the code for this example, sure enough, this right here is a nice picture of exactly what we're talking about. Where This is the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. We have this paraboloid that's opening downwards. And this right here is a plot of the, the, the function itself, the scalar function on that surface. You see that it's a uh, highest values are up here at around 4 uh, and its lowest value is around 0 down around here and as you move over the surface right the the, the value of this function changes um, so we're gonna go through and actually compute uh, uh, exactly what this value is gonna be of the surface integral of this function And by the way, you'll notice that uh, this is exactly in the form to apply that simplified formula that we derived, because this is just a function of x and y. Here, z is a function of x and y for this surface. Um, so that formula in terms of x and y for the surface integral Is equal to a double integral over this region, this domain D, of the function phi of R of XY times the square root of one plus df dx squared plus df dy squared d dy dx so in order to use that formula and you, you notice that uh, that formula uh, to formally get that formula I, I re-parameterized the, the, the surface in terms of u and v but um, for, for this problem, because we have f as a function of x and y, we can just take x and y as our two parameters, u and v, on the curve. And it exactly matches this formula right here, um, which is really nice. If you want to, you can always parameterize in terms of u and v. But um, it, it's, not, it's not necessary as long as you're proper, properly using the formula.
So in order to evaluate this, we first need uh, the uh, partial derivatives of f with respect to x and f with respect to y, which uh, we have. Right? The partial derivative of f with respect to x is going to be the partial x partial derivative of 4 minus x squared minus y squared, which is equal to negative 2x. And a similar calculation will yield that the partial derivative for f with respect to y is equal to negative 2y. Also, phi of r of xy is going to be the function phi with uh, x and y and z plugged into the function phi. So um, the function phi of r of xy is going to be 2y squared plus z which is 4 minus x squared minus y squared divided by 4x squared plus 4y squared to the plus 1 to the power of 1 half. So when going through and evaluating our surface integral, this ends up simplifying to the double integral over the domain D of 2y squared plus 4 minus x squared, and simplify that a little bit, 2y squared minus y squared gives us y squared, so this is going to be 4 plus y squared minus x squared. Divided by the square root of 1 plus 4x squared plus 4y squared. This is what phi of r of x, y is. And then we multiply this by the square root of 1 plus df dx squared, which is going to be 4x squared plus df dy squared, which is 4y squared. dy dx. And so we get a really nice cancellation here. And our surface integral over S becomes equal to the double integral over D of the function 4 plus y squared minus x squared. And this is just a, you know, a nice double integral that we can go through and evaluate. But we do have to be careful because uh, this domain D is a non-rectangular domain. Um, specifically, right, it's this uh, upper quadrant of the circle of radius 2 in the xy plane. So we need to figure out what the ba correct bounds are for this region. Because D is a set of all points x, y in two-dimensional space, such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. A circle of radius 2.
So because of the uh, polar symmetry in this region, um, the, the most natural coordinate system to do this double integral in is definitely uh, polar coordinates. So um, uh, if you remember, you hopefully you remember from your calculus, multivariable calculus class for double integration, uh, polar coordinates gives you a, a dA or dy dx of r dr d theta. And um, this region is very, very nicely described in polar coordinates, or it's much nicer in polar coordinates. It's r theta or theta between 0 and 90 or pi over 2 and r between 0 and 2. So it's much nicer to describe in terms of polar coordinates. So we're going to use that uh, polar coordinates in our integration. Um, that being said, you can go through and do this integral in Cartesian coordinates. And I, I will include that at the end of these lecture notes um, so that you can see how to go through and do that uh, in Cartesian coordinates. It takes a little bit of a long time, so I'm not going to go through and do it. But I, I always think it's a good exercise to go through and if you can do an integral in as many different coordinate systems as possible so you really get a feel for how to do your, your double and triple integration. Uh, this is what I always encourage people to do in a multivariable calc class. Um, so try to you know, replicate my results uh, by doing the integral in Cartesian coordinates as well uh, in your notes. But uh, I'll include that at the end of these notes so you can take a look through for yourself. So this double integral, when we write it in polar coordinates, is going to be well, 4 plus y squared in, in Cartesian, in polar coordinates, x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta. So it's going to be 4 plus r squared sine squared theta minus r squared cosine squared theta. And then dy dx is going to become r dr d theta. And our bounds are for from 0 to pi over 2 and for r from 0 to 2. And trust me, this function looks a little bit more complicated than this function right here, but it is 100% worth it to do it in polar coordinates rather than Cartesian coordinates. Yeah, trust me on that because I went through and did it myself in both coordinate systems and uh, it's definitely a little bit longer uh, because of the, the non-rectangular domain in Cartesian coordinates. Um, so we go through and this becomes by linearity for r dr d theta of this integral plus the double integral from 0 to pi over 2, 0 to 2 of r squared sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta dr d theta and uh, it's actually not r squared it'll be r cubed because we have r squared here and r here it'll be r cubed and uh, we can go through and we see that this is going to be equal to the integral, well, the, the first integral here is with respect to r. So we can factor out the constant. And we don't have any functions of theta in here. So this really is just going to be the integral of 1 d theta uh, for 0 to pi over 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 of r dr. This is going to be plus then 
the integral from a zero to pi over two of, and because this also does not depend on theta, it's gonna be r cubed dr times the integral from zero. Oops, this is from zero to two. This is from zero to pi over two. So the uh, nice thing about double integrals is that you can always split them like this if the two functions are multiplicative. And so this integral becomes 4 times pi over 2 times r squared over 2 from 2 to 0 plus r to the fourth over 2 from 2 to 0 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2. At this point it's convenient to use the double angle formula for the sine squared minus cosine squared. So recall that sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta is the same thing as 1 minus 2 times cosine squared theta which is the same thing as cosine of 2 theta times negative 1 this is negative cosine of 2 theta and thus this will be equal to well 4 divided by 4 is 1 this is pi times 2 squared plus 2 to the fourth divided by 2 times and this is actually negative because a negative sign here And the integral of cosine 2 theta is 1 half sine of 2 theta. And it's evaluated at pi over 2 and 0. So when we evaluate this at the, the end points, this is going to end up being 0 minus 0. So this entire thing is 0. And we're, we're left with the answer of 4 pi.